Hey guys, had some technical troubles and we dropped the first couple of minutes of today's episode, but don't worry, there's still 90% of the chat that we had with Alan Toovey. Enjoy. You've got McAvaney, Cometti and Roberts. And then you've got these two. Nuffies. Living in denial. It's Croft and Horto. Welcome to the Fat Side Podcast. Pretty good team, Croft. That's a very good side. There's uh, quite a few guys there. Um, then moving forward, came up to draft time for you to get selected. Now, you didn't actually go in the normal draft. You slid through and went pick two in the 06 rookie draft. Um, can you talk us through that a little bit? Like, were you a bit worried that you weren't going to get selected or had Collingwood given you the word up that they still wanted to take you then? Uh, um, yeah, so draft time for me, I'll, there was myself and a few other guys who were – the last of the 17 year olds for the previous draft, mm-hmm. which when well, I, I missed out on a draft completely um, along with a few other guys like Andrew Swallow, who were kind of, you know, the same age and played a lot of footy together then. Um, so we kind of missed out one year and then I missed out again in the second draft. So um, I Collingwood rang me up straight after that second draft and said, I, oh, you know, we're looking, at you for a rookie spot did you want to come and train with us for for a few weeks and there was the main team was away in arizona i think it was their first or second uh, um high altitude training camp so it was just um a few vfl guys and and a few other guys trying out for rookie spots we're all kind of living together and training together and there was you know a couple of senior players that that were injured, that were doing rehab and stuff. But it was just, yeah, we kind of had the club to ourselves and all the players were away for, for most of that. And then you know, they came back for the last week that we were there and training-wise and things, and it all went pretty well. Um, the club said, you know, they were definitely looking at me but couldn't make any guarantees. So uh, they had one pick for, like, the pre-season draft. Um, so I was hope, hoping to get in, get picked for that, but... Um, I wasn't too fast as long as I got picked up. And then, yeah, on the on the day I got a call from, it was a, the Claremont um, general manager gave, gave me a call and said, oh, congratulations, you got picked up. And I, it was before I'd actually heard from anyone from Collingwood. So I said, well, who, who picked me? And he said, oh, it's Collingwood. I was like, oh, beautiful. And then hang up that phone and phone call and got another couple straight away from, um, from the Collingwood guy. So I was pretty pumped to, to be going back. Wow, that's amazing. I love that. Um, it reminds me of one of the, I think it was one of the young boys that got picked up by Melbourne recently. He was out on the tractor and his dad was trying to get him to come in. He was waving him to come in. He wasn't coming in. He got on the UHF and he was like, Marty, you got picked up. <laughs> and he, they couldn't get him to come in for a while. It was pretty funny. But Toobes, I just want to take you back to your um, your debut, which was... um. Absolutely berserk. I, I wasn't even aware of this, by the way, Croft. I was doing my research this morning. Thank you, Wikipedia. And um, for all the viewers and listeners' sake who aren't aware, Alan Toovey kicked three goals in his debut against Richmond. Now, of course, Toovey, you went on and you played 159 games for the club. In those pre- preceding 158 games, you only kicked a further six goals. What happened that day? That's an unbelievable debut. Yeah, well, I was actually meant to play the week before um, in WA against West Coast. So, you know, leading up to that week, we had a meeting and um, Mick came up to me and said, oh, congratulations, you're going to be playing. Um, you better better get ready for the trip to Perth. So, I was kind of all planned to go back home and had friends and family that were um, getting ready to come to the game and see me play. And then it was... The next training session, Mick said to me, he goes, oh, the weather's looking a bit bit different to what we expected. You, you might not play, but, you know, it's only just a, a small chance you won't play. But, yeah, but still get yourself ready to play. Like, it's only, just keeping your back in mind, you might not. I was like, oh, okay, no worries. And then uh, <laughs> the, the last meeting bef- on the Friday, I think it was a, it might have been a Thursday or Friday before the game, he said, yeah, no, nah, you're not playing. So everyone that made the trip up to Perth to watch the game kind of was like, oh, well, we're just going to go watch a game. I'm not playing. Uh, so I flew flew, uh, flew back super early from Perth to, um, to Melbourne, went straight from the airport to um, Optus Oval, and we played a VFL game there. Um, 
And then, yeah, the next week got to play against Richmond. So it was kind of like a two-week ordeal to get that first game. But um, I've actually played up. I played forwards, uh, forward pocket, forward flank, just standing next to Anthony Rocker. That first game um, it was a defensive forward on Brett Delidio. I think it was his uh, his first season, and he'd played, I think, every game that year, and was rebounding pretty hard off out of the back line for Richmond. So it's my job to uh, to play on him, and he kind of just did his own thing, and I just stood there, and the boys kept kicking the ball to me. So I had, I think, I had five shots on goal that game. And I probably only had another five or six for the rest of my 158 games. So a little bit different. That's amazing. That's pretty good. Uh, but surely after that game, you were penciled on to keep playing in the forward line. Um, most of your career, you're a defender. What was the change between you going back to forward? Or forward to back, sorry. No, that was I was always a backman up until then. So um, I, I got a little bit of time in the midfield um, tagging a bit um, early days. But yeah, it was always meant to be playing half back. So it was just really a one-off. And I think Mick kind of thought, well, that worked out well and we'll, we'll leave it at that. Now, it took you a couple of years before you became a, a regular starter um, for the team. And then 2009, you played 24 games for the club. Um, what sort of changed over that year? Was there a feeling when you were like, yeah, I've got it, I'm a regular team member? Were you fitter? Or was it just that, you know, the selection started to work your way to find a regular footy? Um, no, I think I definitely improved on on a lot of parts of my game to to make sure that I was always picked. Um, you know, I was kind of picked early days just for athleticism and being able to um, just focus on one role or one or two parts of the game and just lock down someone or, um, you know, just play, do your, be a role player. And then, you know, when those... Um, roles were required for a game I'd get picked but when they weren't then I wasn't so you know I was in and out a little bit and probably didn't didn't play that well in, in a lot of games um, early days but then you know I improved my kicking and and general knowledge of the game and my ability to lock down the opponent so like um, when I started getting consistent games I was you know one of the first guys lined up on a dangerous forward so when you know kind of got that number one job on a medium or a small and you know there's always someone they want to lock away in a forward line so that when I got that job you know locked it away as mine that's when I kept playing consistently. Just on that quickly before I talk about something that's become a bit of a fad on the Fat Side podcast um, who were the dangerous forwards you speak of them there but opposition wise which ones did you find really difficult to contain to? Um. A few boys like um, Surioli, Eddie Betts. Um, who else was there that I played on a fair bit? Jeff Garlett, um, yeah. Jetta. Those guys that don't get a lot of the footy, you know, they might only touch it a dozen or so times a game, but, you know, they can kick four or five goals in a quarter with only 10 touches so or in a, in a game. So but they were the hardest ones to contain because you couldn't really – think oh, over a game you know I've had three good quarters and really kept them out of it you know you know three out of four is pretty good but that if as soon as you kind of switched off a bit those guys would make you pay and they didn't need to touch the ball much um, to have a real impact on the game so yeah they were the kind of ones where you really had to play 100% of the game out before you could really sit back and think oh yeah no, I've had a good game um, and, and done my job. So 2010, incredible year, uh, but as I just alluded to, we've been asking a few of the people that have come on this podcast already about the grand final parade because we've been lucky enough to speak to a couple of players who have played in premierships and one of them being Tom Boyd, um, who had a funny story about the fact that blokes are yelling out to him that you're not worth a million bucks. Um, and then you had Alex Johnson, he was... I think he was bullying. Well, I don't know if we uh, confirm this, Croft, but I think Alex Johnson may have been bullying poor Mike Pike, the Canadian bloke, uh, which meant that Mike didn't want to sit in the car with him, um, which was rather interesting. And uh, Alex was saying it could have upset team chemistry. Um, do you have any peculiar stories from, from Grand Final Parade? And, and who were you sitting with? 
Um, I suppose also next to Tyson Goldsack, and I suppose something that's interesting about that was that he actually wasn't playing that game. So oh. he was he was the first emergency. Um, so to sit next to him was uh, kind of bittersweet. You know, you're in trying to enjoy it for yourself and you, you know, it's pretty easy to enjoy it. But then the guy sitting next to you, you know, he's missing out on playing that game the next day. Um, so that was, was kind of interesting because we had the, the grand final parade and then, then, you know, the game played out as a draw. So he actually, in the end, got to play and got a premiership. But yeah, on that day, you know, there was a lot. Of, he did get a bit of attention from, you know, there's a lot of media there, and a lot of people asking him how he felt. And I remember one interview, he said, you know, well, there's no one to blame but myself. I I didn't make sure that I was always in the team. You know, I've been in and out, in and out. Um, I don't, you know, have any bad feelings towards the selection or anything like that. Um, but yeah, that was kind of an, an interesting thing. For, for me with the grand final parade and uh, the end of it, I don't know if you recall, there was when the, the captains were up um, holding the cup. So there was um, Max up there with Lenny Hayes um, and the Collingwood crowd started doing the Collingwood chant and, and drowned, drowned all uh, the St. Kilda's <laughs> um, guys out and he couldn't, couldn't really speak or say what he needed to say just because you couldn't be heard so that was also a bit of a, a weird one because it was great to hear all the Collingwood fans but also you want to show a bit of respect to, to mm. the other players out there and yeah you got nothing Rob you know all about that being an Essendon fan oh uh, yeah I know all about our Collingwood fans and their booing ways <laughs> uh, the grand final it's an absolute corker um, you know it's a draw um, there's only been a few in history and obviously after that one we're not going to have any more uh, again we'll probably be going an extra time first question where were you when the ball bounced away from Stephen Milne with a minute to go? Were you inside that defensive 50? Were you on the ground? Where were you? I reckon I was just on the 50-metre line, like running towards that pocket. I reckon the ball was kicked over my head and I was turning back, um, running towards it. And from my point of view, he was nowhere near it and could never have gotten near it. Okay. And it was only until the replays were shown later on and people were talking about it and asking me about it that I even considered it. And then when you do see it, the footage, it looks like he's pretty close to it. But it, like in real time, I wasn't even a thought that, oh, that was lucky he didn't grab it. Yeah, so hang on. you at the Yeah, okay. So at the time, no, the ball's going to bounce away from him. Wait, and are you thinking when you watch it back to you're like, shit, we got really lucky? Like the replay... Yeah, definitely. Like, were there a few boys that actually spoke about it as well? Like, that's how close we were to losing this flag? Oh, yeah. Well, afterwards, not not in that week straight after, but after we'd won it, yeah, a few guys were kind of talking like, that was pretty close. And But there's heaps of moments in a game that, that can change it, especially in a draw. But, um, yeah, that was one that, yeah, it looked, it looked a lot closer um, on TV than it felt went on the ground yeah that was uh an absolutely berserk moment um i just want to ask you about the feeling of of uh of of uh winning a a grand final but before we get into that what about the preparation during the week because modern footy particularly in the 2000s and even probably now too since you've got out of the game like sports science has become such a big thing and it plays such a big part um but that, the preparation during the week and the amount of tape you would have watched from the grand final, was that probably the most intense week to prepare, to prepare for a game leading in, knowing that, well, you're playing the same team and you've been given a second crack? Like, was that a really uh, testing, critical, pre- I guess, pressurised week for everyone at the club? Um, no, it didn't really feel like that. That whole kind of final series, it felt like we were... You know, we had a, a really strong season and especially that back half of the season and the final series just felt like we were just fine-tuning things, just little tweaks here and there and we are you know, playing, playing good, good footy and like every week was just an opportunity just to get that little bit better and, and just tick off on, on the little things that we needed to. And then 
leading into the grand final after the draw, it was just felt like another finals game again. We we didn't change anything. We kept it up exactly the same, you know, with what we did with our preparation and training and, and all that. Just did it the same as, as we had for the last, you know, six or seven weeks of the end of the season into finals. So there was like obvious things like you'd, go to the training and there's thousands and thousands of people just screaming at you while you're training and cheering every time you kick and handball the ball to each other, like helicopters flying around. Like that was one thing I remember. There's like two or three helicopters flying over the training session the whole time that we're training and they'd get security guards kind of moving everyone out of the way when you're trying to get on and off the ground because there's just like a sea of people there. But like, it was a bit of a novelty and everyone enjoyed it. I think the coaches made a point of letting everyone enjoy different things and soak up a bit of the atmosphere because you only get to live it, you know, once or twice if you're lucky, a few guys, you know, three or four or five times. But um, it was kind of good to appreciate it and enjoy the moment. And that kind of took away the nervousness for, for us, I think. Because the team as a whole, you know, after that, after we went through our review from the draw and kind of looked at the things that we did badly and how far under our average we were in, in key stats, when we looked at it, it's like all we have to do is play to our average and we would have been able to you know, perform a whole lot better and we did that the next week. Now that second grand final, let's be honest, you absolutely smashed the Saints. Uh, the moment that stands out, though, is going to be Heath Shaw's smother. Nick Raywalt running into an open goal, and then out of nowhere, Heath Shaw appears and pulls off one of possibly the greatest smothers ever. Um, what was it like knowing that your teammates were bringing that level of effort uh, to this game? It, it kind of just felt like no matter what the Saints guys were going to do, it was kind of everything was on our side that day. And like you think, I remember at that stage, I think we were maybe couple of goals up already and things were looking pretty good for us um, and that kind of didn't really lift up as much as I think it, it kind of pushed them down you know that was their first like little bit of break in the whole game and it was denied right on the last last kind of centimeter of the field so yeah it definitely lifted us but I think less of the lift for us and more of a kind of a push down for them but um, yes if you ask Heath about that I reckon he said smarter than the century <laughs> every every second sentence came out of his mouth for the next week was something along those lines. So he certainly <laughs> enjoyed it. <laughs> oh, I love it. We're going to be speaking about him a little bit later. So we can't not speak about the Rat Pack, Croft. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We have to. We have to ask Toves. Um, Toves, the siren goes. You've won a grand final. Um, all that hard work. Uh, obviously, being a rookie as well, coming through, I guess, the... Uh, the unorthodox or untraditional way, you know, not a big name coming into the system. You really had to earn your stripes and um, really fight for a position in the team. So what's it like? Can you describe it? Because I know Tom Boyd and, and Alex Johnson explained to us that it, it really is surreal. It's one of those things that you probably just have to live as a human being. But what was it like for you? And did it had added significance knowing that the boys had already been through 120 minutes on the field the week before? Um, yeah, I think it, it was uh, um, a bit different with having to play that first game. Uh, yeah, it kind of just felt like just one big match in the end and, and um, like a, you know, like an arm wrestle where the first half was game one and the second half was game two and we came out in the second half and, and played so much better and won. But um, the feeling was, I remember thinking, you know, it's all about yeah, just the team and, and the guys out on the ground for the first, you know, hour or so. And then, you know, once you're kind of back into the change rooms and you see the rest of the coaches and you get to spend time with the other guys and the support staff, you realise, oh, yeah, it's all about the club and everyone's really enjoying it and your friends and family. And then the kind of, like, it's about an hour or so of that. And then you're going to get outside of the ground and you get to see all the fans and realise how much you know, it means to all of those people as well. And then I reckon it was nearly a week of kind of those feelings where it's gone from just the, you know, the, the guys next to you in the back line that you're really happy with and for to the to the whole team and it just spreads out. And then you're kind of actually thinking about, you know, the, the old Collingwood supporters that you know from 
you know, back in WA who, who were pumped for me when I got drafted to Collingwood, how much it means to those people when you hear from them. So that, that was one thing that I remembered. It was just, you know, you're really happy for all the effort that you've put in over all the years, not just the one year or the, you know, the one game that, you know, you've built up and become a good enough player to be a part of the team. And everyone's done that. And, you know, the reward is awesome for all that effort. But, but then you realise it means to, you know, everyone else and that kind of adds to, you know, the, the feeling of pride and accomplishment that you get from winning the grand final. Now, we're doing a bit of research this morning um, and I was looking at a, a report from the Herald Sun about that game. Now, Jay Clark and Scotty Gullen from the Herald Sun, they gave you a 65 out of 100 for the grand final replay. But what got me the most was their summation uh, of your performance. This is what they wrote. They said, nuts and bolts, man stood up in key contests, still looks like a possum though. No passenger. Um, can you explain where this uh, possum thing comes from? <laughs> well, we're talking about my debut. That was a Friday night game. And um, um, <laughs> Brayshaw was one of the commentating, was it Triple M that they were on? Um, yeah. And after the game, I was I was speaking to them, and he said to me, "Has anyone ever told you you look like a possum caught in the headlights <laughs> when you, when you're playing out there in, in a night game?" I was like, oh, "No, no one's ever said that to me." <laughs> but um, everyone loved it, and that's where it came from because they reckon the, the MCG lights were shining in my eyes when I was uh, running around out there. So yeah, possum was from from game one to the end. So right yeah, it stuck. Possum, it's bloody weird, but uh, I don't mind it. Uh, it's time for the Rat Pack. Hey, Shaw, Dane Swan, Chris Tarrant, Ben Johnson, Alan Didak. Uh, I think I've got them all. Um, explain the makeup of, of this group too. So I know a lot of Collingwood fans, uh, particularly the Pies Nation, who are a podcast that we are, we're partnered with and do a lot of work with. They're great lads. Um, they're very interested in this one too, so make sure you give a lot on this particular point. But... Uh, the Rat Pack, what's it all about? How did it come about? And were they actually a Rat Pack? Um, I, they were there and it was happening before I got to the club. My Chris Tarrant was only there. I think my first season was his last with the Pies when he went to Frio and we played again when he came back. So he wasn't there for most of it, but they definitely were a Rat Pack. They, um, I don't know how it came about. They were just blokes that enjoyed themselves off field, uh, probably a bit more than than most. And uh, unfortunately, made headlines for it a few times. But um, you know, there was a stage there where it was like every every Monday morning on the way or Sunday morning, if we had recovery, you'd come in and the reporters waiting at the door, asking questions about how you felt about your teammates' actions and. You'd, walk into the change rooms, like, which one of you boys did something last night? But um, <laughs> the thing is, when, when people talk about the Rat Pack, I think they don't ever talk about how good those guys were to the rest of the players, especially the younger guys. Like, um, I think Alan Didak, especially, was one of the best teammates that you could have had. Like, from anyone that was moving from interstate to Melbourne, he'd make sure that if you ask him, oh, yeah, we're... Um, I'm living here. Where's where's somewhere good to go out for dinner? Or my parents coming in. Where we should go see things. He would organise. He'd call people up and make bookings for you and tell you where to go and make sure everyone was looked after. And always doing something for the, for the players, especially the younger guys. Um, so and and Ben Johnston was the same. You know, he as much as those guys got into trouble for for negative things off field, they were they were great guys to be playing footy with. Uh, Love a joke and, and good, good blokes to have around. You know, have next year, but um, they did definitely look after the boys as well, which was great. Like I sat um, next to well, Swanee was one locker away from me from pretty much my whole career, so you know, we, were, we were pretty good, pretty close. But um, you know, pre- very different off field, but um, you know, really nice guy. And those guys, you knew their friends because they're always very loyal to each other and their friends, but um, yeah, really good teammates as well. So, Toos, is it safe to say that Swanee never invited you to his private booth at Tramp on a Friday night? That's that's definitely true. 
I, I did not did not make the <laughs> and a tramp appearance at all. I don't think. <laughs> Now, uh, back to a more, more serious side of things. Uh, Mick Malthouse was your coach for uh, most of your time there at Collingwood. Um, we had Mike Sheen on for our very first episode, and it's safe to say their relationship is uh, indifferent at best. Um, what was it like being under the tutelage of Mick? Uh, what was he like on a good day, and what was he like on a bad day? <laughs> um, yeah, with Mick, I think the, the, the best thing about him um, was you always knew where you stood and everything was was kind of spelled out for you. It was pretty clear. If you're going to do this, uh, then you'll get a game. And if you don't do that, you're no good to us. So you won't get a game. And, and that was it. So you he would just tell you one or two simple things. And if you could do it, then you're, you're in the good books and you played. And if not, then you're out. He definitely had um, a great ability to know how to speak to different guys. So he could, someone would say like Benny Johnson, you know, or Lee Brown, he would, he would get stuck into them in front of the front of the group, you know, just give them the spray and get them fired up. But, um, you know, someone who's a bit different, maybe like a, a Leon Davis, he, he would speak to him quietly and privately and, and, and sit down and, and run through things differently. So I think that was one of his key strengths. He would be able to communicate with each each player in the way that they would be able to understand clearly um, and get the best out of out of those guys. So I, um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed playing playing with Mick um, or for him, under him, I guess, because um, he would say, "This is your role. If you do it, you get another game. And if you don't, then then you're out." And it was just simple, and that's how it was. Did you have much to do with Mick outside of footy? Like, would was Mick the type of bloke that would text you personally or text the players would he create those type of relationships or was it more you came in and did your day to day and when it was footy everyone was focused on the job at hand but he just didn't really have a relationship outside of it because I find it really interesting nowadays you see um, even European soccer managers and big time NBA coaches have this man management relationship outside of the sport as well, where they're constantly checking up on them and, and becoming more, I guess, friends and mates. Was Mick like that or not at all? Not at all. Um, I'm guessing maybe with some players, he would would have been a bit like that. But um, no, it was to see him at the club and that was it. So yeah. it was just yeah. a purely professional relationship and that suited me really well. Yeah, it sounds like Mick. Uh, now, in 2011 twos, uh, you top the ladder again. You only lose two games. Of course, Geelong only lose three games. So it's the two formidable outfits playing in the grand final. It was only fair that it would be two you you two teams battling it out. Um, I'm not going to hark on about it too much, but it must have been bloody disappointing knowing that you're up at halftime, you're only down by seven points at three-quarter time, and then Geelong basically just roll over the top of you and kick away in that grand final. Um, it's big for them. It's three flags in a five, six-year period. Um, it's a missed opportunity because you could have won two straight and you probably felt like you should have as well, given the fact that you finished the season top. Um, did that one really burn, knowing that you've gone from the highest of highs to you know the, the lowest of lows, knowing how close you were to two flags in a row? Yeah, that definitely like that. Um, it felt like that. We we started that season and, and pretty much where we left off from 2010, I think we won every game up until we played Geelong and we lost by, I think it was like four points or something. When We, we only lost to them. Like we beat everyone else really well. Um, but I felt like we probably played our better footy in the you know first half of that season and... And coming into the finals, we were still going really well, but we it just, just felt like it was a bit of a harder, harder work than than going into the finals the year before. That might be just me personally, because I had I had a few injuries and surgeries and stuff. Kind of I was scrambling to get back from. I think I had um, some plates put in my hand um, towards the end of the season, but um, we were still playing really good footy, but. Um, we had that really tight game against Geelong, uh, against Hawthorne in the prelim. 
And then coming into that grand final, still felt like, we, you know, we'd played them, played Geelong three times and or twice before in the season and they'd, they'd beaten us twice, but it still felt like, you know, we were, we were good enough to win it. There wasn't, wasn't like we had any reason to think that, oh, well, we just can't beat them or anything like that. But, um, yeah, getting rolled in at the end like that is is pretty hard when you kind of you're sitting seeing the scoreboard start to tick over or out of your favour, um, and you kind of realise that the the joy and, and relief that you felt from winning on the last year you're gonna you're about to taste the exact opposite as soon as that siren goes. And I remember watching the the Geelong guys get up on stage and grab the cup and the little cannons with all the confetti shot out and the wind blew it all over us as we were walking off the ground. We were covered in blue and white confetti. It was, it was pretty uh, pretty bitter, the taste that you, it gets left in your mouth after experiencing, you know, a draw and then a win. I suppose it, it's almost just that you get the loss as well. But... Um, yeah, it's not a good feeling, but, you know, they were great sides, so you can't take anything away from them, at least. You know. well, it wasn't like we didn't show up and got hammered for the whole whole game or anything like that. But, um, yeah, definitely disappointing. And uh, a last one before we play a bit of a quarantine quiz. Uh, the AFL, AFL fans in general, they love an ooh, they love an Adam Uze or a Matthew Cruiser, but for you it was twos. What was it like whenever you got near the ball that the uh, Collingwood would faithful would uh, ring the ooze around the ground? Yeah, uh, I, I really enjoyed that. It was uh, it was awesome. The, um, it was pretty handy a few times when I was thinking I might be under the pump running for a, an open ball, thinking there might be someone about to nail me or get there before me, and the crowd would crowd would call it out really early, so I had a bit of confidence that I wasn't wasn't too hot if they were. They were backing me in to get there first, which was good. Um, and I reckon it might help a couple of times interstate when we're playing, you know, in Adelaide and everyone starts booing. And I was you know, taking the credit for that, thinking I was getting a few cheers. Maybe I wasn't, but um, uh, it, was, it was good fun. So, Toves, come on. You're a cult figure of the Collingwood Football Club. You built yourself a little identity. Um, it was a bit weird. Like, you'd, you'd come in under the radar found your spot in the team, play all those games in 2009. Then they start the twos chant. Um, Collingwood fans in general are calling you a cult figure. Um, did you just love it and take it on board? It, it was what it was, I guess. Yeah, it was just a bit of fun, really. Like um, Dale Thomas was one of the first boys to get on board with it. He, he absolutely loved it. After the game, he would always be laughing and carrying on with it. Um, but... It was always just it was just just fun I think the crowd it's probably lucky I didn't get that much of the ball so it was a bit of a novelty for the crowd they only got to do it a few times a few times every game they might have got sick of it otherwise but uh but yeah it was good fun uh, everyone I used to live in Richmond so I'd be going down the walking down the street and people would drive past and scream it out of their cars so we get it at uh, at all different times of the the day and night which was uh not quite as fun as when it was on the ground, but still it was entertaining. <laughs> I'm sure it was. Yeah. Now, uh, we, we started this last week when we had uh, Alex Johnson on, and it's fair to say you set the bar very low, but uh, whilst we're in lockdown, we're playing quarantine quiz <laughs> with uh, the people who we get on uh, the program. So 10 questions, some are footy, some are general knowledge, but uh, I'm sure you're going to do a lot better. Then uh, Alex Johnson did. So question one, Tubes. Uh, who won the 2009 Brownlow medal? Swanee, wasn't it? That is that is incorrect. It was Gary Ablett Jr. So oh. <laughs> When was Swanee's? Uh, that's a good question. Oh, was it 11? Don't sound Brownlow. Or was, it, or was it earlier than that? I think Rob's looking it up. Uh, no, it was 2011. There you go. I was, there you I was go. correct. Yeah, 2011. Poor start. Question two. What is the capital city of Indonesia? Uh, Bangkok. No, that's Thailand. Uh, that is, that's, that's, another, that's another one wrong. Uh, in, uh, Jakarta. Dude, you told me you'd be good. <laughs> Jakarta. 
<laughs> Jakarta, yeah. All right. Question <laughs> Question three. Question three. Uh, this is purely because I heard a song of theirs on the radio this morning. Uh, name two of the three members of Destiny's Child. <laughs> Destiny's Child. Um, is it Lisa Left Eye Lopez, one of them? No, I'll give you. Okay. A, I'll give you a clue. I'll give you. I'll give you a clue. One, one of them is Manny. Beyonce. One of them. Yep, Beyonce is one. Beyonce is one. Oh, and the so the other girl that was on um, like the voice or something. Yeah, do you remember what her name was? Come on, come on, Tobes, come on. Um, no. Nah, uh, Kelly uh, Rowland and then the other one, Michelle Williams, yeah, which, yeah, okay. which no one remembers. But I'm going to give you a point anyway. Uh, question okay. four. Uh, who is the game's record holder for the Collingwood Football Club? Who's played the most ever games? Um, 313 to be exact. So Tony Shaw. Tony Shaw is correct. Well done. Yeah. Two points. Is it, it's like Heater's about to hit. What's Heater on now? 200, uh, 307 or something, isn't he? Yeah. I yeah think he's so. sure. Yeah, that, that. But obviously quite a few of them would be going to the, the Giants. Yeah. Uh, question five. Yeah. Who is the Australian Minister for Home Affairs? Um, I'll have a stab in the dark. Is it Peter Dutton? It is Peter Dutton. I would have also accepted Mr. Potato Head. So, well done. Toves, you're on a roll, mate. You're on a roll. Uh, question, yeah. question six. What is the world record time for the 100-metre sprint held by Usain Bolt? Cool. Um, it's like, I have no idea. Well... I would say something like, was it 9.78? Oh, close. It's a bit lower. It was 9.58 is what I was looking for, but well done. Uh, Could I give you a little stat yeah. to go with that one? Yeah, please do. Okay. Apparently, he holds out of out of the top um, 10 fastest times ever run or fastest yeah times ever run. I think he has the... Oh, top nine of them or something out of the top top ten. That's wow. insane. It's insanely good. It's insanely good. What was your hundred meter turfs? What could you do it in? Um, no, it wasn't a, not that good. Hundred, four hundred was mine. I um, was good at four hundred, but I reckon I would have been like definitely in the ten point one somethings. I would Ooh, say it's pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> As if <laughs> you got to, you got to. That's so quick, Tubes. With a good wind and maybe a short track, I reckon at the club. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the seventy meter. Yeah, track. the se- seventy meter track at Olympic Park. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I reckon that might have been it. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> All right, uh, question seven. Can you name the three Lord of the Rings books slash movies? Can you name the three? Um, Fellowship of the Rings and The Return of the King. Yep. And come on, come on. Got two, one to go. The two Towers. Yes, yes. Is well done. Cool? Well yeah. done. Moves. On the money. I like that. Yeah. All right. Question eight. <laughs> this one's a multiple choice question, so I'll read out all the options. How many games did Mick Malthouse coach Collingwood for? Is it A, 243, B, 311, C, 286, or D, 212? Oh. Uh. Go to the 311. That is incorrect. It was 286, which is uh, option C. Oh, Mickey boy. Question nine. Uh, 
You might not know this because you don't live in the state anymore, but what is the tallest mountain in Victoria? Would it be up to Falls Creek, somewhere up near there, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's, we're, we're the only yeah. mountain there. Is it Mount Buller, is it? No, it's not Mount Buller. Close, though, is Mount Bogong, which is 1,986 metres, which, which on a global scale is a hill. So, <laughs> And uh, lucky last question, Toves. The 2010 drawn grand finals, obviously the, the most recent drawn, the one previous was in 1977 between Collingwood and which other team? Uh, North Melbourne. Oh, he knows his staff. That is absolutely correct. Well done. Well done. Well, Toves, you finished with 50%, which is a pass. So you're, you're through to the, uh, the next round, whatever that is. <laughs> Alex Johnson hasn't made it, but you're, you're through what to the next what round. Did, what did Alex get out of 10? Uh, two. So... Oh. We okay. had to stop. We had oh, to smash stop. him. Yeah, we had to stop because he was doing so bad. So. <laughs> nice. I, I, I was going to say, uh, we'll do a leaderboard, Toves, and we'll come back to you in ten weeks, and we'll show you where you are. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll, we'll get we'll get that sorted. We might have to. We, the quarantine quiz might be over by then, if we're lucky. If we're lucky, hopefully. Oh, we, we, we don't know. We'll have to see what happens. But um, no, he did well, too. So I was a little bit disappointed with a couple, though. Um, yeah, I should have um, got, got the um, Jakar. That was a bad one. Yeah. Yeah. You should have really been looking at probably a seven. You let yourself down a bit. But hey, you smashed John O's. So you're top for now, mate. So I'd take it. So it's fine. Um, We'll leave you to it, mate. It's been great. You've been very generous with your time. What have we been speaking for about? 45 minutes on my watch um mate all the best um during this lockdown period hopefully everything works out with work and um and your wife as well and um mate it's been great talking about the pies really enjoyed your insight very refreshing and i'm sure the pies nation who's a partner of ours i run this on their channels i'll absolutely love it so um thanks for being a good sport and thanks for jumping on with this no problem thanks guys um hope to be uh seeing a fair few of these coming up soon and uh, i'll be keen Keen to see how these guys go with the quiz. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Sweet. Cheers. Thanks, Sweet. guys. Thanks, Bye. James.